All right. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome. Happy Thursday, everyone. And uh, just want to welcome you. We have a really great show lineup for you today. And uh, today we're going to do a little bit more of a clinical topic, which I love, love, love. We are here with uh, Diane Rishkoff. So excited to have you, Diane. Thank you. Um, and she, yeah, welcome. Uh, from Health Takes Guts Incorporated. So um, very much true to her uh, business name, we are going to be delving into gut health today, right? So, right. so, so many people nowadays are struggling with gut health. And I know in the work that I do, um, I, I work with lots and lots of practitioners who are specializing in this particular area. So really happy to, um, to have Diane. So let me give a quick overview of some of the things that we're going to cover for you today. Okay. Kind of a, a, a wide breadth of, of gut related topics. So um, the main thing, the title, Gut Healing Made Clear and how to catapult your expertise, get better patient outcomes and feel confident, which obviously in this particular area is so important. So, you know, the long and short is Diana is gonna be sharing some of her secret sauce um, in terms of how she works with patients that are struggling with various types of gut health issues, um, her philosophy in terms of, you know, um, dietary changes, testing, and supplements. And uh, yeah, so I think you're going to get a ton of value today. So before I jump in, by the way, I'm Leslie Bytel. For those of you that don't know me, welcome. So happy to have you here with me. And uh, so I just want to give Diane a nice warm welcome. And um, Diane, tell us a little bit about how you ended up here as like kind of I mean, really a go-to expert in the area of functional, the functional approach to helping uh, people deal with gut health issues. Yeah, well, I um, became a dietitian 17 years ago and I kind of, I was always into science. I was always into digestion. I have Crohn's disease myself, which is oh. now bowel disease. Um, oh. but regular conventional dietetics did not really do much in that area for like really serious uh, gut issues. But nonetheless, I, I liked being a dietitian. And then when my health kept getting worse and my health took a turn, that's when I was like, there's got to be more out there. Uh, you know, that was about 10 years ago. And I was like, there's gotta be more answers. And that's when I found functional nutrition. I was like, yes, underlying Fine. causes, root causes, not all this just suppressing things with um, medication. So I love the ideas that functional medicine has already, you know, put forth about getting to the root of the issue, which is always, you know, there's some, we can talk about that, but always some kind of microbial piece. There's always an inflammatory piece. There's often stress and food pieces and so on, but um, that's what did it. And it helped my personal health and it helped all of a sudden my patient outcomes went from night to day. So. Oh my gosh. And I don't think, I mean, I've known you for a long time. Uh, we've been in this, in this world kind of, you know, crossing paths. I didn't know that you yourself struggled with Crohn's. When were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed when I was 18. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's a big deal. Um, and then I went away to college anyway. I didn't let it stop me, but I was pretty sick in college. And then, um, in my 20s and so on. I'll bet. Fine. I mean, since I found, I mean, for the past 10 years, I'm doing much better, much, much yeah. better. So I'll bet when you were diagnosed, they, you know, you got all the meds, right? Yeah, all I got was meds. And I didn't know to, I didn't know. And I asked about diet and they were like, oh, well, you know, and they gave me some advice and I didn't quite, it, whatever. And that's why I became a dietitian. I was like, let's find out what else is going on. And, but like I said, it didn't quite answer it either. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have um, several clients that are that specialize in IBD, and um, one has it has uh, IBD herself, and the other one's husband um, is has that diagnosis. So you know, they I think um, yeah, that firsthand experience is definitely helpful in understanding you know what your patient or client is going through, especially when it comes to IBD, right? 
Well, I think firsthand experience is huge in two ways. One, you really can connect with the client. You know what they're going through. You know how to help them with expectations and also give them hope because look, you're doing well. And I also think it gives me a lot of motivation. That's where I got here. I mean, I took every course. I took every, read every book because I have all this personal and professional interest. So it gave me a lot of motivation to kind of get the expertise. Yeah, absolutely. So they threw a bunch of meds at you. Obviously, you didn't get a whole lot of results. And uh, from what I hear from my clients that work with patients in this area is, unfortunately, like our medical system does not really acknowledge the role that diet can play in, right. in this particular diagnosis, right? It's kind of like, well, it's all meds for the most part. Well, I know, for IBD, they do that. And I also, I would say IBS which is completely different and not mm -hmm. the same disease, but IBS, I, 10 times a day I hear from people, well, I have IBS, I've had it for decades, and the doctor says diet has absolutely nothing to do with it. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, because IBS is, is, there's nothing actually wrong. Like with Crohn's and colitis, there's something actually medically wrong. With right. IBS, there's nothing wrong, which means it's all about diet, stress, right? microbes, you know, and so on. With IBD, those things play a huge role, certainly diet, supplements, and so on, but there's, there's actually a disease there too. Um, whereas IBS, there's nothing actually there. That's where we come in, you know? It's that catch-all diagnosis. Um, yeah, so what, give us kind of the scope of who you work with under that big umbrella of gut issues. Yeah, so pretty much, you know, anybody who, who has digestive issues, even GERD and gastritis, but I do love and um, really excel at IBS and IBD okay. um, and anything functional like that, the whole IBS family. I mean, IBS to me is the beginning. It's like, okay, you have IBS, the doctor has dismissed you. Now, what do we got here? Microbial dysbiosis, SIBO, you know, not enough stomach acid, not enough enzyme. There's always something going on. Um, and all those things apply to IBD as well. Food yeah. sensitivities, you know, um, inflammation, leaky gut, they're all there for all those people. So IBS and IBD and just sort of chronic constipation or, you know, even if they haven't been diagnosed with IBS, the same kind of symptoms, bloating, cramping, unable to eat this, unable to eat that, you know, reactions to foods, those are all in the same category of, you know, what we can do with functional nutrition. Exactly. Yeah, so interesting. Um, and I assume SIBO fits in there. Yes, right? okay. exactly. All right. Uh, and what about food sensitivities? Yeah, well, food sensitivities are, are real, you know. Yeah, where do food sensitivities fit? In, in well, sometimes, sometimes they're they're a key part. You know, sometimes food sensitivities are one of the root causes, and you know, gluten sensitivity, for instance, absolutely causes leaky gut, causes all these problems. But other times, food sensitivities are a consequence. You know, if somebody has dysbiosis and leaky gut, and, and their immune systems all frazzled and they're having inflammation and then they anything they eat becomes a food sensitivity and so then the root cause is not the actual food it's the you know we have to heal the gut mm -hmm. so it's kind of hard to tease that out but certainly it can be the root and I, I would say oftentimes it's not but it's definitely part of their picture people okay. experience food sensitivity yeah. all the time so give us kind of an overview of you know your um you know, I guess your approach, like where do you start? And if you can kind of break down your philosophy for us a little bit, just so that our audience can uh, get a better understanding of your approach and what to do when they see these uh, patients in their practice. Yeah. So, well, I'm a big fan of the 5R okay. protocol, which is, you know, developed by, you know, Dr. Jeffrey Bland and, you know, the father of functional medicine and uh, so it's not mine originally. I wish I could take credit, but I can't. Uh, it's um, quite brilliant, right? It's quite brilliant because it's tailored to the patient. So, you know, you, can, you can't, it, unfortunately, you can't just learn one protocol, 5R protocol, and you're done. But you can frame every case in terms of, okay, these are the, these are the steps that we need to take. These are the pieces of the puzzle. So, again, microbes, diet, you know, um, digestion. So, well, one R is remove, which you remove like inflammatory foods and you remove microbes. You know, another R is replace or restore where you're replacing their digestive um, 
systemic acid enzymes vial if they need it. Another R is repair, where you're repairing the leaky gut. Another R is re-inoculate for putting in good stuff like probiotics, prebiotics, resistant starch. Another R is mm. relax for stress. Because stress is huge. We cannot forget about stress. Everybody's stress, and that will sabotage anything else we do. So then I can just, when I when I was a little bit younger and I was a little bit less confident, the 5R really helped me just that way. I was like, okay, and I know what to do. I know what to do because I'll just put this case and I'll say, what do I need to remove? What needs to be replaced? Like, it's just a very nice organized way. And then, you know, you've got yourself covered as opposed to just like, oh my God, this case is so complicated. I have no idea what to do. Um, at least it's a framework. And so yeah. that's, that's what I love. And I, you know, I continue to use it and I, I now teach it to other dietitians. I love that. Can you go into more detail in terms of like your approach within, I don't know, either all or even a couple of those R's? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I have a couple of pearls, you know, that I always yeah. say to my mentoring clients and I'll say it to here, which is for diet, we want to do, we want to take out anything that is obviously causing people problems. Oh boy, hang on. <laughs> Keep going. I have my dog scratching on the screen. Oh, they're gonna go nuts. All right. <laughs> Say hello. This is Piper. Uh -huh. <laughs> She's excited because somebody's here. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that, Diana. I'll put myself on mute till things calm down here. Okay. Can you go live, right, guys? You never know. <laughs> yeah. So, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. I was just saying that we want to um, balance um, taking out things that are inflammatory or, or disruptive to their, you know, symptoms, but we do not, I like to have them on the least restrictive diet possible, the most very, you know, and the least, you know, we don't want to incite fear and food anxieties and, and possible eating disorders. So the least restrictive as possible. And yet also let's see, maybe they do need to eat less sugar, alcohol, gluten, et cetera. So that's my general philosophy with food. Um, and then my philosophy with supplements is is also balanced in that we need to use them. They're really key for these gut health pieces. I, I think, you know, most, not all, but most cases cannot be dealt with diet alone. We need to fix the dysbiosis and, you know, give them some more stomach acid, whatever the case is. And um, so we need supplements. We shouldn't be afraid to use them. They're in our scope of practice. We should learn about them first and become knowledgeable, but we shouldn't be afraid to use them. And we should never put anyone on a supplement they don't need. We should never keep them on supplements longer than they need. So we do have to be careful and responsible and, and try and be the least, they should be on the least amount of stuff that they need. Absolutely. So those yeah. are my for those things. Yeah. Your pearls. Yes. I love that. Do you have any, um, I guess, you know, favorite supplements in terms of categories? That you yeah. the most sure 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 for remove you know removing dysbiosis or SIBO or, or parasites or whatever I really my go-to's are biocidin and paragard so biocidin okay. is by biobotanicals and it's got a lot of research behind it and it's got a few things in it like oregano oil and black walnut oil um and then paragard is by integrative therapeutics and it has garlic and berberine and wormwood. So together, those two really look at, that's a broad spectrum amount of antimicrobials. And that's, of course, only if someone needs it, but a lot of people need it. A lot of people have dysbiosis and SIBO. So. Awesome. And then in terms of determining their level of dysbiosis or, you know, kind of nailing what the problem is, tell us a little bit about how you go about doing that. Yeah, that's a good point. Because not everyone is going to need or respond, you know, to just biocide and, and Paragard. Because the question is, you know, do they have SIBO? Now, SIBO, SIBO breath tests are something we can order. They're also something they can get at the doctor's office, um, and it'll be paid for by insurance, you know, and so on. But if they have, you know, hydrogen SIBO, we would, I would be more looking at, you know, the oregano oil and um, neem and berberine. Which, by the way, the biocide and Paragard kind of cover some of that. But if they have methane dominant SIBO, I would be looking more at allicin from garlic. So I might use Alamax or Alamid as the products for sure if someone does that. And still maybe some biocidin or something just to round out. Your biocidin does a really good job of creating a good environment in there so that the good stuff can happen. Um, 
And then if someone has, I do stool testing if to see dysbiosis is really clear on, for instance, the GI map, which is the thing I, I like the best. Um, not everybody has to do that though. If someone's had IBS for 30 years and, and you know, they have diarrhea and constipation and bloating and, you know, we, we know they have dysbiosis. So we don't have to charge them for these expensive tests, but I do like the GI map if someone's interested. And then you can see like they have all, there's a whole dysbiosis page and it has all those different bacteria that are not supposed to be there, the Citrobacter, mm -hmm. the Ciella and so on. And um, we can say, oh, there's a lot of dysbiosis here. We need, we need this good broad spectrum acting antimicrobials or look, you know what, there's not that much dysbiosis. Maybe we should focus on the other R's, you know, the mm -hmm. repair and the remove and um, not remove the replace and so on. So. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, and, and so you use GI map kind of as your, as your first line. I and do. That Genova. No, GI map is diagnostic solutions labs. Oh, right. Okay. The GI yeah. effects is Genova. It's good. Yeah. Great Plains labs has a comprehensive stool test. Vibrant has a, a gut zoomer. I mean, they're all good and they okay. all have, have a place. Awesome. I like the map. I just use it. It's a little bit cheaper also. So yeah. And um, obviously many of uh, people in our audience today. Hello, Jan, by the way. Hey, Jan, good to see you. Uh, are uh, dietitians. And um, at least in my experience, Genova is not always the easiest to work with when you're an RD, right? That's right. That's why I don't use it, actually. I can't order from Genova. Yeah, exactly. Are there any states that allow ordering in Genova from Genova if you're an RD? I don't, I don't know. know. Massachusetts I can't. But I know there are other ways to get around it, like the Rupa or whatever it is. But I haven't. I just, I've got my, I've got for 10 years now, I've got my account with all these different places and I just use. We're kind of used to it. So, yeah. Why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear from our audience in terms of any questions that you guys might have. We've got the expert here, so bring it on, right? I'm sure uh, Diane would be happy to um, offer some insight in terms of, you know, any of your questions. And um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about your, um, so basically in the work that you're doing right now, you're working, you're still working with patients, right? That, that have gut issues and it, and you're also helping other practitioners. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your, how you balance that, you know, are, are you focusing more in one area? Tell yeah. us about the, the, you well, know, specific think... work you're doing. So I do still see patients one-on-one -on -one and, okay. and I, I still love that. But I, I really, I think, you know, I really, really love mentoring other dietitians. I got into that about five years ago. And um, so I started mentoring people one-on-one -on -one in terms of both building a functional medicine practice and how do you get into the labs and the supplements, and the, but also cases. They have this case, they don't want to feel alone. They don't feel confident. And so I would help them with cases. So I did that with people one-on-one -on -one just as appointments, you know, as needed. Could be once a week, could be once a year. So that was great. I loved that. And then I developed, um, I wrote an ebook about the 5R. And then I developed my course for other dietitians or health professionals on gut healing. And then I have my group mentoring, which kind of came out of the course. It's separate from the course and you don't have to do both, but it kind of mm -hmm. goes, it's complimentary where that we have a group. It's a great group of community mm -hmm. we meet twice a month. And it's cheaper than the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but you still get help with your cases and you definitely don't feel alone because there's you know 30 of us and so it's great so I have those services and I love that I love the course and I love the <laughs> mentoring the group mentoring that's awesome yeah 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 um and by the way hey Gina how are you Gina said that uh Florida you can now order from Genova which is I knew there was like one maybe two states that uh where you could uh, order from Genova. So super interesting. I know Illinois is not one of them because <laughs> I tried and it was not going to happen. So, um, but anyway, uh, I, I appreciate some of those alternatives, Diane. Um, let's see. So we got a question from Jan. So Jan, hey, Jan. Jan's wondering lately about GI map. Recently, another functional practitioner shared a three split sample results. And except for one pathogen, appeared to be three different 
patients. Have you ever done uh, split samples with them? No, I, I'm not sure. I mean, they only ask for one sample in a in a kit. The GI right. map. Nova sometimes asks for several, like three. But G, if you order GI map, it's one sample. So I'm not sure how this came back with three split sample results. What I do know, though, is that things change a lot, and um, meaning in the gut. And so yeah. I've had people take it the GI map, you know, multiple times, and it's very different. And maybe that's because of what we're doing, or maybe it's because it ch the, the microbiome changes even by what on your how, how you slept and so on. And so we have to take the GI map as um, okay. She's clarifying, but anyway, we okay. still take the GI map as a, as, with a grain of salt. They sent three different names, same person, same day. That is odd. It's not good. Doesn't sound good, right? Yeah. Um, I've never done that. Yeah, yeah. I've never tried all that. Um, yeah. But so it's interesting. maybe it's different because like if if the same person, same day, now we're talking about stool that maybe was in their rectum and then stool that was in their large intestine and then stool that was up from their small intestine. So that also could be why there's different microbes. But yeah, no, absolutely. I think in general, this is probably why I said earlier, like if we know that the person has a variety of symptoms and their history is such and such and you know things we can't go into in too much depth right now but like we don't need a test to tell us that they need help in these areas because these tests are great but they're not perfect and so why not spare them the expense of and, like who would want to do that right right that's it right <laughs> that too <laughs> um yeah exactly so yeah i, li I like that philosophy um because i i would just imagine that yeah, I would just imagine that it's for a lot of people. Yeah, they just wouldn't want to do it, is my guess. Yeah, and sure they don't want to pay for it. it. They don't want to pay for it. I mean, I'm very, 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 you know, not, I don't pressure anybody to do any tests because, yeah. you know, it, and they do. They've, go to, they've gone to functional medicine doctors and, and the doctors have been like, I need to do this, this, and that, or test. And, and they it's turned off the patient. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not, not going to get that from me at all. We're going to talk a lot about your history. We're going to talk about, what happened in your life that caused these various, you know, health challenges. And I can kind of see, we got the 5R going, we don't need a test, you know? Exactly, right? Like just use critical thinking. Um, I, I totally see where tests fit, uh, but I feel at the same time, and I think we concur that a lot of times you can help the person with the data that you have, right? Exactly. And, and okay. then if, if it doesn't, like if your plan isn't working or if the patient's not improving, then, you know, testing can be awesome. And some, honestly, in some cases, this is kind of going back to my nutrition days. Uh, some people are like, just, let's just do it. Like I want to get there faster. I don't want to experiment. And I would say, okay, well, let's do testing then, you know, but yeah. for other I, people. Exactly. It's, it's up to the client. It's up to the yeah. client entirely. And, and I can use critical thinking. That's a great way of putting it, critical thinking. And that's what, that's what I try and teach in the course and, and the mastermind is critical thinking because we, if someone can't afford it, that doesn't mean they, they can't, we can't help them. Doesn't want to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that philosophy. Um, I think, oh, wait, we got, oh yeah, Delia. Hey Delia. I know you. How are you? So are a lot of people seeking help for IBS? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All day long, all day, every day. I get emails of, you know, people because, because the doctors aren't very helpful, you know? And so doctors are very dismissive. Oh, IBS means you don't have anything wrong with you. There's nothing on your colonoscopy. You don't have cancer. You don't have celiac go home. Um, and so absolutely people um, are, are seeking help for IBS. Everybody's got IBS. I mean, not everybody, but it seems like a lot of people. Lot of people. Um, and, and they're, they're discouraged and they're, uh, they're not getting any help elsewhere. So we are the perfect people to help with IBS. I mean, IBD, they need a doctor for sure. Yeah. But IBS, doctor's not helpful. So that's where we are, we shine because that's when it is food and it is, you know, dysbiosis and it is stress. So that's where we come in for sure. Um, yeah. And Jan, amen, running 10 tests when one or two will do. Yeah. I love that. That's such a good philosophy. Um, yeah, and then Jan, so many people diagnosed with IBS have celiac. Oh, yeah. interesting. That's a whole nother topic, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. They should go get that sorted out with the doctor because that's what the doctor can, you know, test for, and so can we. But the doctor can test for that, you know. Yeah. And then uh, I don't know who who sent this in. I can't see the name, um, but I think this person's asking you, Diane, if you take insurance and wanting to know a little bit more if you have any experience with functional gut practices via insurance. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do take insurance and it's a it's a good question and a good topic and it cuz it's 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 a very good question and there's a yeah, a longer answer, but basically it's um cuz I'm an RD and I'm licensed in Massachusetts, I can accept insurance and then I'm doing kind of unconventional stuff, but the insurance companies are okay with that, I guess, because I have my license and I'm an RD. So it goes fine. But um, um, and people love it because they're used to paying thousands of dollars for their functional medicine practitioners, and here I am taking their insurance. So I think it's also really helpful. It, you know, I can I can treat a less wealthy clientele and, and people who need it and so on. Um, and so in terms of functional piece, I don't think that's a, been a real problem with the in, in insurance. I just know that I can tell you there's a lot of uh, it's tricky to accept insurance. You know, there's a lot of hassles. There's a lot of like, and now they've cut our, I don't know if it's happening elsewhere, but Massachusetts, um, two big companies have cut uh, our pay. And I'm like, so I'm getting oh, less money. Dang. Oh my God, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. that's so terrible. That kind of stuff is, is, you know, annoying, is, is very tricky, but that's technically in terms of what you're asking in terms of the functional and the insurance, there's no, there's no real problem. Okay, so yeah. I'll, but what about the um, the diagnosis? Uh, I I wasn't aware that like IBS that diagnosis was covered. Oh yeah, no, I'll, almost anything okay. is covered. Although I, I do use Z codes a lot. Okay, like the okay. surveillance codes, right? They're, the they're always covered. Like they're always yeah. good. Um, and then I'll put like the Z code and then the IBS code, and um, okay, it seems to go okay. Yeah, but I think right, I, there are some companies and some plans that don't cover anything besides yeah. diabetes. Well, yeah, diabetes and renal, like or right. obesity, right? Like those, those the triad, and then otherwise they can be real sticklers. But um, I think, like, I don't, I never dealt with insurance, but um, I think the Z codes are the way to go, from what I know. Um, okay. So, hey, Gina, in your experience, what percent of your patients did not fare well with low FODMAP? Great question, because that's what I hear. Like, do you find this, Diane, that the GI docs, like, they'll hand their patients, like, go on the low FODMAP, and the patient's like, oh, my God, how do I do that? And they try to navigate that themselves. So what do you see in that department? Well, I see that. The people are like, my doctor told me about this diet, and I don't know what to do. But, um, and I don't have a percentage for you to answer your question specifically, but I will say that it's, I would rather treat the underlying cause because even the, the low FODMAP people say this low FODMAP diet doesn't actually fix SIBO. It doesn't actually fix dysbiosis. That's still there. Um, you, you can ask them, you know, the Von Ash people, yeah. the, they say that. So, so the FODMAP diet's great for relieving symptoms and that's important. But we still got to do the 5R to figure out, you know, to kind of rebalance the microbes in there because it's the microbes in there that are chomping on FODMAPs and, and causing, um, you know, the intolerance. Unlike a food sensitivity where the immune system's involved, the FODMAP intolerance, there's no immune system issue. This is really just a digestive issue that's caused by SIBO or some kind of microbial imbalance. So I'd rather treat SIBO with microbial imbalance versus giving them a diet that's very, very difficult and they end up with food fear and, you know, all that. Oh, that's right. That is such a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, yeah. so good. Um, yeah. <laughs> amen. Another amen from Jan. Intolerance <laughs> of FODMAPs means something else is off. off. Yeah, that's a Band-Aid. Um, absolutely. And it's not just me and Jan saying it's a Band-Aid. The, the FODMAP people will tell you it's a Band-Aid. I mean, it's yeah. just, um, it just is. It doesn't treat the underlying cause. Should all IBS patients be tested for SIBO? Um, probably, yeah. Yeah, probably. And they can do that through their doctor for, for you know, insurance. And then they can do that through us. We can order that test. Um, but sometimes you could tell, right? If somebody is 
bloated right after they eat. They're gassy. They're more bloated as the day goes on. They wake up with a flat stomach and then they're pregnant at the end of the day. If they have rosacea, if they have low B12, low iron, if that's SIBO. And then if they look that way, you know, you don't need a test. But testing is, is good in terms of um, because it's covered by insurance. So why not? In that case, there's no financial downside. But you also can use your critical critical thinking to find out like there's clearly some SIBO here. There's clearly some, um, but all IBS patients have some kind of microbial component. Like, I can show you studies like they all have dysbiosis, and whether it's SIBO or not, it's it's mm -hmm. all um, it's all micro. There's there's some kind of microbial piece, just like there's some kind of stress piece too. Most IBS people have a stress. There's like there's a stress part of it. I always wonder, like, what is that tipping point, right? Like, some people have dysbiosis and they're relatively asymptomatic, right? And then other people have, you know, maybe a similar level and they're like completely symptomatic. So, yes. I'm yeah. always curious, like, what, I don't know, it's probably not even something we can answer, right? <laughs> it's just in my own brain pondering. Like, well, everybody's, everybody's different. Everything well, has to be individualized. Yeah, we have to individualize their 5R. We have to individualize their treatment plan. And then, you, you know, there's some troubleshooting. Not everybody responds. SIBO is a tough one, especially um, in terms of not everybody responds so well. I never dealt with SIBO when I had my practice. I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not your girl for SIBO. But um, I think nowadays there's a lot more resources than there was back then so, yeah and a lot more knowledge there's more yeah, research absolutely yeah i was like uh, yeah i just don't know enough um it's interesting because that seems like SIBO is kind of a it's a more recent i mean i'm sure people had it back then but back then like it was 50 years ago right but you know even what it's been i don't know eight years seven years um yeah. since i saw a client well, clinically and no, like know. there wasn't a whole lot no I mean, I, I'm sure I had it since I was 18 and nobody told me, nobody tested me, right. nobody did anything around antibiotics, uh, you know, and then I, I, I anyway, so yeah. um, I'm sure my parents had it. Hmm? What are your thoughts? Like, cause that's what I hear all the time. Like I still hear people tell me this, like, oh yeah, I have SIBO. I took antibiotics. I feel great. And I'm like, oh boy, it's just a matter of time before well, I like I mean, I actually don't hear that that much. I hear, I have SIBO, the doctor gave me antibiotics and I still feel like crap. And I'm like, that's because they didn't do the other five, four R's. You know what I mean? And also there's a piece of SIBO, which is the motility piece. Like there has to be some kind of motility supplement forever because the motility is always kind of, well, not always, but most of the time it's, it's quite compromised with SIBO. And so they need, yes, it's going to come back unless you sort of, optimize their digestion and get the motility working. All right. Got one more question here. Uh, Abby. Hey, Abby, how can RDs order these tests in an outpatient setting? I mean, you, I, th I don't know as much about like if, if there's a conflict with your outpatient job or not, but I mean, you, you, as an RD, you can sign up with aerodynastic diagnostics. I have an account with Neurovana. These are home SIBO breath tests. And you're, yeah. you're an RD, you can be, you can order. And so then, you know, that's it. And then the patients would have to pay out of pocket as opposed to we can't order through the hospital the way a doctor could. But so I often encourage my clients to save money and go to their GI and have them order a SIBO breath test instead of doing it through me. And they still opt to do it through me because they don't like the doctor or they don't want to deal with doctors being stubborn and says SIBO doesn't exist. I hear that. Um, yeah. But the, you know, they could do it through the doctor at the hospital or they can do it through one of these companies and we are allowed to order from these companies. So that's good. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so Diane, as we start to wrap up, time has flown, right? I know. Yeah. yeah. So any, I guess, final words of wisdom. And I also want to make sure that uh, everyone listening, both to our live, as well as those of you that are going to grab the replay, I want them to know how to learn more. So um, any final words of wisdom and where can we learn more? Yeah, well, you, you can learn more in general from this millions of sources, right? Like, you know, all about the- you. About, <laughs> me, yeah, about, about you, about you. Yeah. Like, you posted your- um, I did that. Um, your, 
Yes, healthtakesguts.com, healthtakesguts.com. There's a, a four RDs menu item so that, you know, because the rest of it's for the regular population, but four RDs. And if you click on that, like it'll show you there's a, there's protocol, protocols, my book, um, my course, which I think people love. It's like I've gotten really great response to the course, um, the individual mentoring, and then the group mentoring, which also tremendous, just people find it so beneficial, so impactful to have that group. Um, so I encourage- it's, like it's lonely, right? It's lonely. Like other types of practitioners have that supervision. So guys- well, it's And it's also, there's that confidence piece. I like giving other RDs confidence. There's, you know, you, yeah. you got this, you know what to do. Here's what you can do. And here's also some encouragement. Like the course is kind of so detailed, so densely packed information in the course. And yeah. then the mentoring is like, well, let's talk about you. and why do you have those doubts? You're good. You're good, girl. You know, like it's, there's a lot of confidence issues and we're good. We, yeah. it's something we can do. I love that. Yeah. So anyone listening, I highly recommend join a group, right? Get, join a mastermind, join, you know, like otherwise it's just, you're just kind of by yourself, your own, yeah. you know, and, and it's very, very isolating. And um, yeah, and your mind can definitely play games, right? Like you start to second guess. Honestly, we get in our own way. Left to our own devices, I would say most of us can really get in our own way. So love that you've got a group. Um, I think that is amazing. And then it sounds like the course really will get, and by the way, is that evergreen? Meaning It is evergreen. The course is evergreen, which is why I created the mastermind because people want some actual Q and A, but um, the course is, is self. What self pace. Okay. Awesome. So they can, uh, so everyone here can just go and um, right grab that, that <laughs> kind of that foundational training um, to increase your confidence around gut health. And then I would definitely join uh your your group um, yeah, as an add-on add so yeah. yeah any final words of wisdom as we start to wrap up i know there's so much right there's so much I'm just you know it's good yeah. the framework of the 5r is key yeah. and look yeah. learning getting yourself to learn these things i mean whether it's my course or not is not the point it's just you want right. to know what you're doing when you're using supplements um, you want to know what you're doing when you're, you know, taking people on and off diets. So um, more training and then and then and then the confidence piece, which, you know, comes with experience and comes with mentorship. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Thank all of you. So fun. Uh, this was awesome. I learned Thank a lot. Really. So yeah. thanks for sharing your pearls. And yeah, so guys, I want to recommend go to uh, Diane's website um healthtakesguts.com and if you're an rd she's got that uh menu specifically for rds and if you're, if you're not an rd but you're like a you know healthcare professional that's for that's what that okay. is for okay for health pros yeah i've got lots of functional medicine oh, functional. Uh, practitioners as well so yeah, anyone that absolutely. needs some support in increasing you know your knowledge base your foundational like well probably up deeper than foundation um, the course goes yeah. deep. Sounds yeah. deep. Um, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, healthtakesguts.com. And uh, yeah, we've got a holiday weekend coming up, right? So I hope you guys, everyone here, everyone catching the replay, hope you guys have an awesome weekend. I am heading up to Michigan. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm gonna visit some family, head up to Leland, Michigan, to the beach. So I'll be spending um, actually much of June up in um, on Lake Michigan. So it's kind of become an annual thing. So I'm excited about that. Hard to believe we're already talking June again, right? Like, how did that happen? <laughs> um, but here we are. And I'm, uh, I'm excited that it's summer. And so anyway, hope you all have a really fun holiday weekend. Be safe. And um, I will be back next week. Same time, same place. So I'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday. All right, guys, have a great rest of your week. Bye for now.